It's 41 degrees. We have studied in this class on everyday Christianity, the practical application of the gospel to our lives, the principles found in the 21 epistles, Romans through Jude, how to live for Christ every day. We have studied Romans chapter 12, the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 1 through 16, the rules for Christian living in 1 Thessalonians 5, the practical exhortations in the book of Colossians, particularly chapter 3, and tonight we come to the book of James. The Lord willing, tomorrow night in our last session, we'll be studying First and Second Peter. These are the most practical parts of the New Testament. Did you know that the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, and uh, the parables of Jesus, some 30 or 31 in the New Testament, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of James are considered the most down-to-earth, applicable teachings in the Bible. The book of James, from the very first time I started preaching, has been perhaps my very favorite from the standpoint of living for Christ. There are five chapters, and even outlining them in a general way shows you the pertinent nature of this book. Chapter 1 of the book of James stresses pure religion. About ten different precepts or principles or concepts are found in that one chapter, the ingredients of pure religion. Then chapter 2 begins with the impropriety of having respect to persons in regard to the gospel. The gospel is not for the rich or the poor, the black or the white, the brown or the yellow, the educated, uneducated, it's for everybody. And we meet on level ground at the foot of the cross, and to have respect to persons in regard to the gospel is anti-biblical. But then he discusses in great detail in James 2 the relationship of faith and works. And that teaching does violence to Martin Luther's concept that we're saved by faith alone, or Article 9 in the Methodist Discipline that says, and I quote, Salvation by faith alone is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort. James chapter 2 denies every word in that. James chapter 3 speaks of the responsibility of teachers of God's word that will receive the stricter judgment, and then discusses vividly in the next 12 verses the proper use of our speech. And then it closes with a contrast, a vivid contradistinction between the wisdom of this world and the wisdom that emanates from heaven, which wisdom we're taught to seek and yearn for in James 1.5. James 4, I believe, has in it the key verse in the whole book, verse 17, the last verse of James 4. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him it's sin. The need for positive Christianity. I believe that James chapter 4 has as many great lessons in its 17 verses as any other part of the Bible in similar amount of verses. I don't know where you'd ever find a chapter more needed by the church in every age than James chapter 4. There are a lot of people who think they're going to heaven because they never do anything bad. But James 4 says, to know to do good and do it not to him is sin. And then in the 20 terrific verses of James chapter 5, he closes this book out in grand order. And the last two verses in the book say that we're to restore the erring brother. We're not just to be evangelistic toward those who've never obeyed the truth, but we must long for the souls of those who once attended to that and then went back to the world. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he that converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. What greater work could we do than that? But James chapter 5 speaks of the privilege and power of prayer, reminds us of who our judge is, tells us to be patient, prayerful. In fact, I suppose the best known verse in the Bible on prayer by members of the church is James 5, 16. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now that's the opposite of a memorized stereotype prayer. Now let's go back and put some meat on that skeleton outline. But let's remember now these five chapters. Chapter 1, pure religion and its ingredients. Chapter 2, no respect of persons and our faith must be activated in works. You see that how by works a man is justified and not by faith only, 224. And faith alone is like a dead body in the casket. The life has gone out of it. Just the empty shell, the carcass is there. That's the doctrine of faith only. Chapter 3, the proper use of our speech. 
Chapter 4, positive Christianity. If we know to do good and fail to do it, we sin. And that's the definition of sin that's going to be the most severe in the day of judgment for people who thought they were pretty good people. You remember the one talent man? He didn't do anything, did he? We usually say about folk like that, just leave them alone. They're not doing any harm. But the Lord said, you're wicked and slowful and unprofitable and get out of my kingdom. He views nonchalance and apathy differently than we do. And then James chapter 5, restore the erring brother. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, he introduces the book in that fashion, and yet this James is a half-brother of the Lord. He didn't believe in Jesus until Acts chapter 1 after the resurrection of Christ. First time he's mentioned as a believer. In John 7, he mocks and taunts his half-brother. And in other places, he is not considered a friend of New Testament Christianity. But once truly and genuinely converted, he didn't brag about his earthly kinship or pompous credentials. He was a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful he wrote this book, Inspired by the Holy Spirit, because he tells us how to be a servant of the Lord Jesus. It was written to the dispersion, that is, the church dispersed in the Roman Empire. Just like the Jews, God's people, were dispersed in Old Testament days, scattered abroad. So Acts 8 says the early church, because of persecution, was scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the word. They were in unfriendly regions in the Roman Empire, in areas of persecution. And so this book was written to encourage them to stand up for Jesus, even though they were pilgrims and strangers and sojourners and spiritual nomads in an unfriendly world. But I suppose the most memorable passage, and a brother quoted this to me on the phone this afternoon, is James 1, verses 2 and 3, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into manifold trials, knowing that the proving of your faith worketh patience. Job 13, 15 is a classic conjoined with this. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. There will be tribulations, there will be persecution, there will be sorrow, there will be times of distress. But to the faithful Christian, God Almighty has promised in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that whatever the temptation is, God will provide a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. And though it's becoming sort of a common uh, vernacular parlant statement, it's true that I know when I get up every morning that nothing can possibly confront me that day that God and I together can't handle. Then why should I be pessimistic and fearful? 1 Corinthians 10, 13 promises it. Peter said, if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but glorify God in his name. And he said, don't count it strange when you're overwhelmed in trials. Jesus said in John 15, if the world's hated me, the world will hate you. If the world's persecuted me, the world will persecute you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. Why should I think if I get near to Jesus and live like him, I won't have some persecution? Paul said, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's a promise. 2 Timothy 3.12, so if I never encounter any persecution, I must not be living godly in Christ Jesus. We're not only to believe on him, but to suffer for his sake. The salient message of Philippians 1.29. But verse 5 is a classic passage. I re remember he's writing to Christians, not to the world. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. I hear brethren still today pray for knowledge. I hear them pray for faith. I believe that's a misnomer biblically. But we ought to pray for wisdom. See, faith comes by hearing the word of God. So I don't pray for faith. I study the word. That's how I learn. That's how I gain knowledge. But after I know whatever it is I know, I can still be unwise in the way I disseminate it and dispense it. I've known some people who were so unwise in the way they told others what they knew that they caused more problems in 10 minutes than you could unravel in a year. We need to pray for wisdom. I'll tell you one thing, if you were a parent or a grandparent with four children and nine grandchildren, you'd obey that verse. You'd pray for wisdom. And all of a sudden at 60 years old, I'm starting over with a precious little granddaughter and helping in that, and I've prayed a lot of times in that regard in the last three or four months too. But people who claim to be Christians who go very many hours in any day without praying for wisdom are not very wise. <coughs> and so wisdom is how we utilize what we know. 
And we're to pray for that. We're commanded to do that. But we must ask in faith, never doubting. If we do doubt, we're like the winds of the sea, the waves of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. An unstable person, let him not think he'd receive anything of the Lord. Verse 5 through 7. A double-minded man, and incidentally, I want you to just write you a little note or put an asterisk beside verse 8. From that moment on, the book of James will be a study of double-minded people. The book of James not only teaches as an overall thrust, practical Christianity, daily Christianity, but it also teaches the sin of hypocrisy. And in every single chapter, you're going to find a specific point on hypocrisy. A double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. He claims to be spiritual, but he really isn't. James 2, he claims to have faith, but he really doesn't. James 3, he claims to speak properly, but he is a hypocrite and uses the same tongue he blessed God with to curse man made in the likeness of God by God. James chapter 4, ye adulteresses and adulterers, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore would make himself a friend of the world is yet an enemy of God. You pretend to be his friend, but you make yourself his enemy because you're not spiritual. So all the way through this book, he talks about the sin of hypocrisy, and that was the sin our Lord rebuked more than any other. He was truly intolerant of hypocrisy, insincerity. That's why he and the Pharisees had such a rough time. They were actors upon the stage of life. They were play acting. That's what hypocrite means, to play a part. And Jesus didn't go for that at all. I feel sorry for members of the church who have one foot in the church and one in the world. So one fellow said they eat at the Lord's table and sop the devil's gravy. It just won't work. And they're going to be miserable in both, both realms. And many a time I've talked to members of the church who say, I don't get much out of Christianity. Well, they didn't put much into it. This half-hearted life won't work. Christianity is so designed that we must seek him with the whole heart. Psalm 119, verse 2. In Ezekiel 33, 31, God said, You know why my people are in captivity? Because they come to me as the people come, and they honor me with their mouth, but their heart is not in it. Then he discusses the fallacy of putting much trust in earthly wealth and pomp and riches. It's like the sun beats down and withers the flower and dries up the grass. He said, That's the wealth of your life. In one hour so great riches has come to naught. Max and I had a good discussion Monday night before he preached. He said, now you yesterday morning, Wendell last night, stole most of my verses. Well, you know, I noticed he had about a hundred more. And I really thought the most effective part of his lesson, it was all good, and I've already told him this, and I'm grateful I am to work with him and have him uh, in this work and in the school and so forth, and as a friend and a fellow gospel preacher. But I thought the way he handled Second Peter chapter 3, this earth and the works therein should be burned up and all these things should be dissolved, and how he tied into First Peter 2, 9 through 11, it tells us we're pilgrims and strangers anyway. The balance in our concept of what we're on earth for and the fleeting nature of earthly wealth and pomp. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus said in Mark 8, 36 and 37, What will a man give in exchange for his soul? But then he gets into a discussion that is invaluable in a difficult area of Bible study. I don't know how many times I've been asked to discuss verses 12 through 16 and maybe through 17 of James 1. Let me tell you the basic argument because we don't have time to dwell on every verse. The real punchline in James chapter 1 is verse 16. Now, you may think that's an odd statement. Do not err, my beloved brethren. But that's the pivotal factor going back and going forward to tie what he's saying together. In essence, he's saying, quit blaming God for tempting you and start giving him the credit for every good and perfect gift that he pours out upon you. Don't be mistaken, brethren. God doesn't tempt us to do evil. He gives us every good and perfect gift. That's the whole point of these verses. But he said, don't let any man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted of evil, neither tempted of any man. Now, he might test and try people through Bible times and in our day and time, but he doesn't tempt us. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. It's not a case of, look what they made me do. That's childish. It's a case of what I allowed my lust to cause me to do. In other words, there's temptation. And it's not a sin to be tempted because Jesus never sinned, and yet he was tempted sorely, but he didn't yield to temptation. So here's the way it comes. Temptation, 
I yield to that and in my lust, and lust produces sin, and sin produces death. But that's not God's fault. He didn't create us to sin. He created us to glorify him. Ephesians 3.21, unto God be glory. In fact, in Isaiah 43, 7, Isaiah the prophet, the great Messianic prophet said, speaking for God, God said, I made man for my glory. That's why we're on earth, not to sin, not to yield to temptation, but to glorify God. First Chronicles 16, 29 says, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Give God the glory due his name. So we'll have to quit blaming it on others. <laughs> Denominationalism says the problem of sin is inherited and it's not our fault. Have we come into the world stained with Adam's sin, totally depraved? And that's just as far into the Bible as it can be. A man is tempted, he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, and then sin comes and death is the result of that. So he says, don't be mistaken, brethren. Quit blaming God and start praising God. For here's what he does. He gives us every good and perfect gift. They come down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow cast but turning. In Acts 17, 28 and 29, Paul said the same thing to a bunch of heathen in Athens. In him we live and move and have our very being. We're the offspring of God. But I believe the single most beautiful verse on God's rich provisions for all mankind, Acts 14, 17, to some more heathen, pagan, idolaters, in Acts 14, 17, Paul said, God left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Isn't that an exquisite verse? And then he discusses beyond these physical temporal blessings, verse 18, of his own will he begat us by the word of truth. He didn't owe the word of God to us. We don't deserve the Bible. We have it by God's grace and his mercy of his own will. No one forced him to. No man or group of men crawled up in the halls of heaven and said, Jehovah God, give us your word in simple terms. 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Of his own will he begat us by the word of truth. No one had to twist his arm. So if a man is lost, it's in spite of all that heaven has done for us. But we do have a responsibility to that word. First of all, we've got to get rid of the wicked overflowing of naughtiness in our life so there'll be a place there cleaned out to receive the implanted word which is able to save our souls. And beyond that, we must be doers of the word and not hearers only lest we deceive our own selves. Christ is the author of eternal salvation and all them that obey him. He sent his son, revealed his will, gave the plan of salvation, invited us to heaven. I'm lost, it'll be in spite of his will. And so John 7, 17, if any man wills to do my will, Jesus said, he shall know if the teaching be of God. And then he gives what I believe is the classic illustration in the epistles, Romans through Jude. I don't believe there's a greater biblical illustration than the word of God as the mirror of the soul. Have you ever gone through the Bible and listed all the things the scriptures say the Bible is, the word of God is? a sword, a rock, a hammer, a fire. To me, this is the most brilliant of all. The Word of God is a mirror, the mirror of the soul. Now, what does that mean? It reflects us as we really are, not as we pretend to be. See, it takes care of this problem of hypocrisy. After that illustration, you say, if a man claims to be religious and bridles not his tongue, his religion is vain. Or here's the mirror of the soul, the precious Word of God. And it reflects me not as I say I am or pretend to be or think I am, but as I am. And it corrects our flaws. You know what the sad thing is? Some people don't have that mirror in their homes. They have about ten other mirrors for vanity's sake. A lot of people don't even have the mirror of the soul. Then there are a whole lot of other people, high percentage, that have several copies of the Bible, but they never use it as a mirror. Then there are others who resent what they see in the mirror and get mad at God or a preacher who preaches the mirror of the soul. Then the others so arrogant and so stubborn that even when you point out to them from or in the mirror of the soul their deficiencies, they get mad at you or they'll say, I like it the way I am. What if you said to a friend, you need to go look in the mirror. You've got a smudge place on your face. Your hair isn't combed. Your tie doesn't match. Your collar's open. You've got a slit there in your coat. You're not ready to go to work today. 
And instead of thanking you, he gets mad at you and the mirror that told the truth. But I'll tell you the most common misuse of the mirror of the soul in the world in the church. Here's a man who takes out for work at 7.30 in the morning. He doesn't even look in the mirror. He doesn't know if he's prepared or not. He assumes he is. He has some business appointments that are very essential and highly important that day. You know when he looks in the mirror? About 7 o'clock at night when he comes back home. He looked at the wrong time. He represents folk who will say, though they've had a Bible all their life, when you point out what the scriptures say on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, they say, well, I didn't know the Bible said that. And then they'll blame God for the mistakes they made that contravened his mirror. We need to appreciate the mirror of the soul, the Word of God. See how pertinent this book is? Now chapter 2, and I wish we had more time in each of these, but chapter 2. Don't you hold the gospel of Christ with respect to persons. There isn't anything more anti-biblical, ungodly, and non-Christ-like than for members of the church, and let's just be very, very frank, in this part of the United States, for years and years and years, whites were prejudiced against blacks. I'm sure there's some black people prejudiced against whites, but since the vast majority of us in here and in the church in this area through the last hundred years have been white, I think it applies and pertains to us more, here are folk who would claim to be servants of Christ, imitators of Jesus, who taste of death for every man by the grace of God, Hebrews 2 9. The one who died for all, 2 Corinthians 5 14. The one who said, Go preach the gospel to every creature in every nation. And we have purposefully withheld the gospel. And we use some inane, insane arguments that won't float, and we know they won't. Oh, we'll send preachers and money to Africa for. Black people hear the gospel, but we don't want too many black people sitting by us in the church house in Texas. Such hypocrisy. Sometimes we withhold the gospel from the poor and the ignorant and the uneducated because that's beneath the dignity of some of us folk. Sometimes we withhold the gospel from those who are wealthy because we came up in the Depression. Anybody that had a dollar and a half was treacherous. Anyway, and any time, anyhow, we hold the gospel with respect to persons. We do greatly err. We do have a Ku Klux Klan mentality among some members of the church in Tennessee and Mississippi and Alabama and other places, probably in Texas and Oklahoma. We need to be very careful that we never were ever guilty of withholding the gospel. Now, the main problem they had here was in reverse. They utilized their uh, flattery toward the wealthy and the pompous, and when they'd come into their assemblies, they'd say, take this chief place. they say, the poor sit at my footstool. James asked a good question. He said, now, aren't those rich people you're especially favoring the ones who persecute you? Or you're not thinking very clearly. But the truth of the matter is we're not to hold the gospel of Christ in respect to persons in any direction for any prejudice. I was talking with a friend of mine one time about politics, and we couldn't have differed more. That's about the last time I ever talked about politics. I tried to talk about the gospel or football or something important. But anyway, when, we, when I finally stopped talking and took a breath, he said, on what do you bias your opinion? And that was a pretty good question. And then he discusses verses 14 through the end of the chapter the non-validity of Martin Luther's heresy we're saved by faith alone. You know, the Bible does teach in Romans 3.28 and Romans 5.1 that we're saved by faith. But nowhere does it say we're saved by faith alone because that would contradict Romans 8.24 that says we're saved by hope. If it's faith alone, then that verse is wrong. It violates Ephesians 2.8, we're saved by grace. So it can't be by faith alone, but Luther said it was, and since then there have been many commentaries and creed books and manuals and catechisms based upon, built upon, written about salvation by faith alone. But James 2.24 contradicted that, and Luther could see that it did. But when he went from Romans, where he added the word alone, to James 2.24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. He was smart enough to see the contradiction. But he wasn't spiritual enough to be honest with the Bible 
You know what his attitude toward the book of James was? In his first translation of the German Bible in about 1519, he omitted it from the New Testament. Said it is an epistle of straw, a letter of little worth, fit only to be burned. Why did he just say I was wrong back there in Romans? Humility was not his greatest tool. And then later he put it in the back, sort of like an appendix, like an apology. I believe I've met some folk in the church who evidently believe salvation by faith alone because they never do any work. And this book was written to Christians telling them to activate their faith and get after it. Why should we spend 80% of our time trying to twist the arms of brethren who've been members of the church for years and years to do what they should be doing anyway when there's some honest people out yonder who haven't obeyed the gospel yet that would go on and be ardent workers for the Lord if they ever enter the kingdom? No telling how many man hours we waste with deadhead brethren who don't intend to ever be restored. My point is, I believe somewhere along the line we should apply what Jesus said. Don't cast your pearls before swine and shake the dust off your feet when they won't hear you and get after somebody else that would obey the truth and continue to obey it. But salvation by faith alone just won't cut the mustard in the day of judgment. And I really don't know what cut the mustard means, but that sounded pretty good. Chapter 3. <laughs> My brethren, be not many teachers, knowing that we shall receive the stricter judgment. And one more time, I'll say what I've said before, and some may differ, and that doesn't bother me if we differ. We just need to both keep studying our Bibles to see if what we're saying is so or what we're teaching. I do not believe the Bible teaches degrees of reward in heaven or degrees of punishment in hell. I believe this passage is simply saying that in the judgment day, teachers will receive stricter judgment. They'll be judged on a stricter basis because unto whom much is given, much is required. When I teach in the school of preaching, we always have all levels of intelligence, background schooling, educational acumen. I believe it would be totally unfair to grade each one of them on the same curve or however you want to word it. Here's a fellow that doing his very best, sincere best. If graded in a college, would probably get a C plus. But we're not talking about academic courses or secular pursuit. We're talking about the B-I-B-L-E. And he puts his heart in it and he sweats blood. He works hours after hour and he grows and he gets better and better. I believe he needs to be rewarded and encouraged. I try to work them hard and grade them high. But here's a fellow that could make A-plus without even picking up a book. And he's lazy and slowful and smart aleck and unconcerned. I believe you ought to be graded on a stricter basis. But that's even true in any pursuit of schooling. But anyway, he's simply saying you have a greater responsibility. You need to understand that teaching is not a matter of just having the honor of hearing your own head rattle, but the privilege of communicating the truth to lost souls. But then he immediately gets into the proper use of our speech and talks about how little member of the body the tongue is and yet is set on fire of hell and capable of doing much damage and it's very, very difficult to control, bridle, or tame. And thus we need to be very prayerful and use our speech to the glory of God and not hypocritically, out of the same source, spew forth sweet water and bitter. He uses some analogies and illustrations that are classic. And his whole point is proper use of our speech involves two things. That we do speak the truth in love. We do use our tongues positively for God's good. And then we do abstain from misusing our speech. I wouldn't be surprised by what 50% of the brotherhood believes that proper use of speech means we don't curse, slander, gossip. But that's just half of it. How do we use our speech? To glorify God? To enlighten our neighbors? To exhort our brethren? There are going to be a lot of people who don't use profanity at all who misuse their speech because they don't use it right. I state again the illustration I read several years ago. A man said, I knew a professor in a university who was a language teacher who could be silent in 17 languages. Well, what benefit is that? Too many of us are silent in the only one language we know. God has too many silent partners. Too many of us are spiritually tongue-tied. Proper use of speech 
flows both ways. And then he contrasts at the end of James 3, wisdom from above and wisdom from the earth, which is earthly, sensual, devilish, does harm. But the wisdom from above is first pure, peaceable, easy to be entreated, without partiality, full of good fruits. What a kind of distinction between man's wisdom and heaven's wisdom. That's why we need to ask God for wisdom. Sadly, we have some preachers who think more of the wisdom of the philosophers and psychologists and denominational leaders than they do the wisdom contained in the Bible. I just had to believe Moses was wiser than Kierkegaard. I've got to believe that Paul and Peter and James and John and Jesus and David had more sense than some of these German heretics that are still used as the classics in theology. We need to seek wisdom from above. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, you know what the wisdom of God is? It's Christ and him crucified. Though the Greeks seek after a different kind of wisdom and the Jews require a sign, we just preach Christ and him crucified, the wisdom of God and the power of God. I remind you one more time, as I've told several of you, one of the most effective workers we've ever had in foreign evangelism was a fellow that I met in a school of preaching. He'd gone to two years of public school. The only way he knew how to communicate the gospel, he had a good memory, a clear mind, and he'd have people read the scriptures. He would memorize word for word, letter for letter, what had been read to him. And when he preached, he might have one or two ands and these to connect words and verses, but every single syllable that came out of his mouth was the Bible. He went to Nigeria, preached that way, baptized more than all the rest of the preachers put together that had college educations. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a college education. You won't believe it, but I've even got one. But, uh, and I'm glad I'm not as ignorant as I once was. <laughs> But the point we're making is he used the speech he had to glorify God and is the Word of God, Bible. He wouldn't even know how to spell theology, much less what it was, and he didn't care. And you can go to heaven and not know what that means. But you can't go to heaven without the gospel that fellow preached. Chapter 4. Where do wars come from? How pertinent tonight. Where do wars come from? From lust that war within your own members. Machiavelli, who wrote The Prince, a classic work in the Renaissance, said, I'll tell you how to settle wars. Get the warmongers, those who for envious and jealous and covetous reasons plan and perpetrate warfare, get them, draw a big circle somewhere between each of their lands and put them in it and let them fight to the end and whoever wins, the war's over and they won. But really his point is, where do wars come from within your own members, within your own family? Why do husband and wife ever fuss and fight? Why would there ever be an occasion for that? Why do children on the playground double up their fists, try to knock one another's teeth out? You know the worst fight I ever saw in my life? Two girls in the third grade. Boy, they don't fight fair. If they get mad enough to fight, boy, it's hair pulling, jaw squeezing, teeth rattling, rolling the dirt, kick, spew. I'm not joking you, that's fierce. But you take that beyond to wars in the world. We speak of Hitler and Mussolini and Stalin and Castro and others. They're not the only warmongers the world has ever known. And I am not talking about our president. I pray for him. I'm just talking about the climate of war that seems to be everywhere. Whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, a household, the civil war in the United States, the most despicable thing that ever happened in our midst. And percentage-wise, more people killed in that than any other war. Percentage-wise of the population then and how many died. A tragedy. It came from what James says right here. He said, did you know why you don't receive anything from God? Some of you never ask. An insurance salesman in Detroit, Michigan picked up the newspaper one Sunday morning and in the special section there he noticed that his dear personal friend that he was with very often had just purchased a $1 million insurance policy from another company. 
He went out to see him. He said, Henry, why didn't you buy that for me? Henry said, you never asked me. Why don't we get blessings from God that are available? We don't ask. And then when we ask, we don't ask properly. We pray selfishly. Some people never pray unless they want something or they're scared. And so God doesn't recognize their voice. The best plaque I've ever seen on, seen on anybody's wall, and I asked a lady in New Mexico to make me one one time, and she did, and I had it on my study wall for many years, said this, no man has ever gotten all that he could have gotten from God. And that's another way of saying no one has ever prayed as fervently and ardently as he should. Based upon the signal I've just received from my dear brother, you have to listen faster than you've ever listened before. Then he discusses the fact that you make yourself an enemy of God by being a friend of the world. And that's happened to many persons. I've heard people say, God's turned his back on me. God doesn't change. Malachi 3, 6. You turned your back on him. The only way we're ever going to get back to him is to walk in truth where he has never left. And then at the end of this chapter, he says, it is unwise to make plans that leave God out and say tomorrow we're going to go into such a city and buy and sell and get gain. He said, you don't know what will be on tomorrow. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appear for a little while, then vanish the way. Whereas you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll do this and so. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it's sin. The first several verses of chapter 5 is a rebuke to rich men who gain their wealth by holding back wages from their employees and with the money they stole from their employees and their proper support and pay, they bought clothing and hoarded up silver and gold. And he said, your silver and gold is cankered and your clothing is moth-eaten. And he said, let me tell you who you really like. See the cattle out there on a thousand hills? Contentedly grazing today and tomorrow their neck chopped off in a slaughter. That's just the way you are. And your riches will be worthless. Acts 8.20 says your money will go to perdition with you. And then he discusses the fact that we should be like Elijah who trusted in God and his prayer was so effectual that he prayed it would not rain, it didn't rain for three and a half years. Then he prayed it would rain, it did. I believe the purpose of that is to show that the gods that Jezebel introduced into Israel in Elijah's day, Baal and Asheroth, which were the god and goddess of vegetation and rainfall, that they didn't control the destiny of the world, but God did. And that if one prophet of God said, it will not rain, it wouldn't rain. And all those pagan idols scattered in the field, altars under the grove, to the contrary notwithstanding. And he says, and Elijah was a man of like passion, such as we are. Don't you know the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much? I said, here's what I want to conclude with. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, that proves Christians can err from the truth. Therefore, once saved, always saved is false doctrine. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he that converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. Where would you ever find five more practical chapters on daily Christian living? We're going to try to tomorrow night in First, Second Peter, eight chapters in two books, daily, every day Christian living. I hope that you'll be back and we conclude this series. Thank you so much for watching Light for the Way. My name is Charles Cochran with the East Ridge Church of Christ. And we're so grateful that we have the Bible as our lamp and the light for our way as we open its pages and we allow the Word of God to lead us and we desire in our hearts to follow that Word all the way from earth unto heaven. I hope you're having a great day. It's always great when you allow the Bible to give you instruction and guidance for all that you do as you seek to serve and to honor God. A preacher one day was walking through the slums of a great city. And as he came upon two little children, they were looking down in the gutter. And as they were looking down in the gutter, the preacher approached the little children and said, What have you lost? And the little child says, Mister, 
we ain't lost nothing. For you see, they were looking down in the gutter and they said to the preacher, we have found something. He asked the little children, what is it that you have found? And the little children told the preacher to look down in the gutter. And if you will look down in the gutter upon the water, you will notice we have found a rainbow. A rainbow on top of the water. For there had been some oil that had been spilled just a few feet away. And as the oil had gone down into the gutter and on top of the water, the sun's rays and reflection had caused a rainbow to form in the gutter upon the top of the water. What a beautiful illustration that these little children looking down in the gutter had found a beautiful rainbow. Now, isn't it true that if you and I would have the eyes of little children, that indeed we would be able to see the rainbows that are in the gutters of life. For indeed, as you and I have the eyes of faith, and we open those eyes of faith, and we even look down upon the gutters of life, we might be able to see and to detect some rainbows that are in the gutters of this life. And for just a few moments, may I share with you some rainbows that are in the gutters of life? First of all, there is the rainbow of God's Word and God's truth. Amidst the gutters of human philosophy and human understanding. You see, when you and I pick the Bible up, we pick up the rainbow of God's truth. For indeed, found within the pages of God's inspired and His inerrant Word, we may be able to read and discover the truth that is recorded therein. Jesus said on one occasion, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Again, the Bible says in John chapter 8, If you abide in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We understand there is much truth in our world today. There is truth in the areas of science, in the areas of history, in the areas of geography, in the political realm, there is truth. But now there is no truth that can compare with the truth that is found within the Word of God. For God's Word always speaks truth to our hearts. And as we read and as we understand the truth that is found within the Word of God, that truth stands above the truth that may be revealed to us outside of the Word of God. Because there are times, even in the truth, that may be revealed from the philosophy and the ideas of men, that in that philosophy and in those ideas of men, there could be some error that is detected. Because you see, human philosophy, human ideas, is filled sometimes with things that are not always to be true. But when I read the Word of God, everything that is found within the Bible, God's Word, is truth. And I can depend upon it, I can believe it, I can follow it, I can obey it. And as I follow God's Word, I am always following that which is true. And so we have the Bible, God's Word, as a rainbow in the gutter of men's philosophy and human ideas that are all around us today. And so I trust and I believe all that the Bible has to say to my heart. And I hope that you also have that same faith in God's wonderful and His marvelous truth. In the next place... There is the rainbow of God's love in the gutter of man's hatred 
and man's rebellion unto God. One of the marvelous things about the love of God is that it is an eternal love. Eternal in the very quality and the very essence of God himself. The Bible says God is love. Now God is an eternal being, is he not? Being an eternal being, then the quality of love that is within God and within his heart is an eternal quality. Even when men hate God, when men rebel against God, God's love continues. God's love is there. In fact, the Bible says in John 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Again, Paul writes in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. I don't always love God in the way that I should. We understand in our hearts that that love that we ought to have for God is a love that is not always real and not always as strong as it ought to be. But when I consider the love of God, it is a beautiful rainbow in the gutter of man's hatred and man's rebellion towards God. And I also see something of that love in the heart of God as man hates one another. And we see that hatred that is displayed as men murder one another, as men steal from one another, as men do things to destroy others around them. You see, the love that I have in my heart for others is not always the same kind of love that God has for me. When I look at the love of God today, I am amazed and I marvel at the love that God has for the human race. A love that reaches down and will lift man out of sin. A love that will call men unto God himself. And oh, how we ought to understand the quality of love that shines out in a beautiful and a wonderful way. God's love is seen in the gutter of man's hatred and his rebellion towards God. But next, I see something of the rainbow of the cross of Christ in the gutter of man's lost condition. The cross of Jesus stands today as the means of God reconciling man unto himself. Man in his sin and in the state of sin is lost. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3 at verse 23. And again the Bible says, there is none righteous, no, not one. That sin is a transgression of the law of God, 1 John 3 and verse 4. It is to know to do good and then not do it, James 4 verse 17. And thus all of us today are guilty before God of sin. And sin is a wall of separation between me and God. But through His Son, Jesus Christ, through the offering of Jesus as the perfect Lamb of God, He will take away the sin of the world. Thus I see today that the cross of Jesus stands as a rainbow in the gutter of my lost condition. Without the cross, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of Jesus' blood, there is no redemption. But because of what God and Christ have done for us and as revealed by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, I see something of the cross that stands as a wonderful means of my forgiveness and the cleansing of all of my sin. Have you obeyed the Word of God today? Have you accepted the teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ have you come to the cross? Have you been able to stand today in the shadow of that cross and allow the shadow of the cross to fall across your heart, to fall across your life, 
And as the shadow of the cross falls across our hearts and our lives today, my friend, you and I, in the gutter of our sinful state, can receive forgiveness and salvation. And then I see today the church as a beautiful and a wonderful thing that stands in the gutter of this wicked world. The church is a blessing to all that have become a part of that wonderful family of God. You see, the church stands in contrast to the gutter of the wicked world around us. The church is described as a family of God. And I can be born again into that wonderful family of the water and the Spirit. When I thus, by the teachings of the Spirit of God, receive those teachings into my heart, and I obey the gospel of Christ, I then become a part of God's wonderful family, which is the church. And in contrast to the darkness and the impurity and the blackness of sin, the church is the beautiful bride of Christ. That beautiful bride that is holy and pure and has been cleansed and washed and is able then in the beauty of the bride that the church is, the bride of Christ. I can be a part of that wonderful, beautiful bride it is also a safe haven. I can come into the church and find safety within the precious and wonderful body of Christ. And as I look today and I understand something then of the church that I read about in the Bible, then I want to be a part of that church. For I know that the church stands as a rainbow in the gutter of man's wickedness all around his life today. And as that church that stands as a beautiful and a wonderful rainbow of the love of God and the beauty of that place redeemed by the blood of Christ, I want to be a part and I want to be in that church today. Oh, my friend, there are so many rainbows all around us today. If we would just open our spiritual eyes and see the rainbows that are in the gutter of the world around us. Be thankful for those today. See the beauty of God's love shining brightly from his heart to our hearts today and receive those wonderful blessings from him. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a great and a wonderful day. talk to you about a better life, I have a challenge I want to make. I challenge you Ski to chart. memorize one verse of Scripture every week. <laughs> I know that some Ad of switcher. us, I'm over 60, radio, close, and some of us cannot memorize Closing quite. Radio. App, clock, find my, find my, Apple TV, Apple TV, find clock, YouTube, current clock, activate, close clock, closing clock, find my, current action, close find my, closing find my, you, Utunes. Double tap to open. Use three. Back button. Stand for the truth. But again, always lovingly. Speech off. Always looking for the very best of that soul that you're trying to save, besides your own. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, verse 14 has heroes, and then shame. Shame, shame on you all who did not come and fight with us in this victory. Shame on all of you. And she goes right down through and lists these people. She lists the tribes and those that did not come. She does not spare them. She lists them directly. Shame on you, she says. And again, it is Jehovah's battle. Again, Jabin thought with through Sarah that he was going to be victorious, that again there was going to be lots of spoils, but there wasn't this time for them. Not at all. In fact, it went to Jehovah's people. 
And again, verses 20 and 21 shows us that Jehovah fought from heaven. We just don't know what it could be. I might imagine that it would be that there was a storm, a rain, so that the ground became soft and that the chariots essentially became non-effective. It's very possible that this is what has happened. We don't know. We're not told. The Lord pronounces now a curse on Miraz for not helping in the battle. They were in the area which lost most in Jabin's rule. And they would gain the most from Israel's victory, but they weren't a part of it. They received a bitter curse because of this. Then we have the song about Jael. We get into verses 24 through 27 here in chapter 5. Jael is blessed, really, because she dared to be different. She dared to be different. She was not going to be some passive person who just let things go by. But here, here comes the leader of the enemy army, and she is just different enough from others that she's going to stand for truth. And she invites the man in, and she puts an end to him. She puts an end to him. He's dead. His days are over. He will lead no more armies. But she is blessed. She's blessed because she made a difference. She was different than others around her. Now, he was a terror to Israel for 20 years. And she strikes him down with one blow. This strong, powerful man, 20 years had ruled. Uh, you know, after 5, 10, 15 years, you begin to think that you're uh, pretty well set, that you are the ruler and that you cannot be defeated. But one blow from this woman who fiercely loves Jehovah, and it's all over. 20 years of terror, gone. And of all things, the disgrace of being killed by a woman. Oh, what a disgraceful thing that was to these people back here at that time. And we see it more than just this time in Scripture, where somebody didn't want it to be known that they died at a woman's hand. And so, here we have the ultimate insult, the ultimate failure to be killed by a woman. Then we get into verses 28 through 30, the cry of Sisera's mother. The grief of a mother without her son. She had expected a victorious return of her son, but she is left totally empty. Compare this with sin. Sin offers victory, but always ends in total, total defeat. So even here, looking at the circumstances here, Sister's mother, she's expecting him to come back into town leading hundreds of chariots and victorious and having a, a girl or two on each arm and all of the spoils in such a proud moment. But she looks and she looks and she looks and there's great disappointment. And soon she learns her son is dead. Defeat. Total breakdown in this woman's heart. But what a picture of how sin is in our lives. We go into sin and we think that, that we're, we're doing something great many times and we just enter into it and pretty soon the sin grows and we do more sin and it grows. It just keeps growing until it is victorious. But what is our end? If not in misery on this earth, it's certainly going to be misery in hell. And I just, even with the descriptions we have in Scripture of, of hell and torments, I, I can't imagine the thoroughness of it. For God it's 10 o'clock. This is WJHF LP, Florence, Alabama, 106.9 FM. Brought to you by the Jackson Heights Church of Christ. It's 47 degrees. We appreciate this opportunity and hope to begin this series with an overview type lesson. In Luke 22:53, we have some outstanding words of stark reality. Jesus is being confronted by an angry mob. Judas will place the betrayal kiss 
Jesus will turn to this uh, motley crew and say, I was with you all week long in open. Why didn't you take me then? But this is your hour and the power of darkness. What we do with each hour is up to us. Will it be for light or for darkness? In 2 Timothy 1.10, we read that Christ brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Throughout the Bible, there is a contrast between good and evil, right and wrong, truth and error, God and Satan, heaven and hell. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 15, Moses, speaking for God, said, See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. In Isaiah 5, 20, a verse that we'll hearken to many times this week, we read a stern rebuke against those who turned truth into error, light into darkness, and good into evil. There's a tragedy when men pervert that which God has placed in motion. In 1 Thessalonians 5, the first five verses, we learn that evil men love darkness rather than light because their own deeds are evil. Jesus is the light that shineth in darkness, but the darkness comprehended or apprehended it not, John 1, 5. And in John three nineteen, we learn why that's true. When light shines in darkness, the darkness abhors it because their deeds are evil. So today as we discuss darkness and light, we're continuing to see from Genesis through Revelation the contradiction between that which is right and that which is wrong. There are many passages like Joshua 24, 15, Choose you this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house will serve Jehovah. That's set forth this uh, strange challenge that men have to keep their focus on brilliance and light and truth instead of focusing on that which is perhaps easier and more common, that which is darkness. In Romans eleven twenty two, Paul said, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them that fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou contend in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Revelation chapters 12 through 20, the third stanza of the book of Revelation, speak of that great battle that ensues between God and Satan, heaven and hell, right and wrong, truth and error, light and darkness. In a pivotal passage in 2 Corinthians 6, beginning with verse 14, we have these haunting reminders. What agreement or concord hath Christ with Belial? Belial and Beelzebub really refer to that wicked counselor that Nahum 1.11 mentions in the battle in Old Testament days between the prophet of God and the people of the world and just the remnant of righteous ones who wisely chose discerningly that which was light rather than that which is darkness. And so he said, what agreement had Christ with Belial, the temple of God with idols, light with darkness? Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. And I'll be a father in you, and you'll be unto me as sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves of all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the sight of God. There are many passages like uh, Acts twenty six eighteen. Paul standing before King Agrippa. I've come to turn men from the power of Satan to the power of God, from darkness to light. Colossians 1.13 poses the contradiction of the kingdom of darkness as over against the kingdom of light. We've been delivered from the power of darkness, translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, and later in the last chapter, chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, we read that a great battle is being forced between the captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ, Hebrews 2.10, and the prince of this world. And he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And 2,000 years later, that's still the battle. And we hope to say some things in this lesson that will help us understand the situation on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18, 21. 450 prophets of Baal, emissaries of hell, and one lone servant of God. And Elijah said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But I believe the unsung text, that's the background of this entire series of lessons that are contained, most of which are in manuscript form in the book, is Matthew 6, 22 through 24. 
Let's get the background, familiar words. For some reason, we stop at verse 21 and jump the verses that really set forth the challenge of truth and error, light and darkness, heaven and hell, God and Satan. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth. This is familiar to us. Where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth consume, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If thine eye be single, how great is that light. But if thine eye be not single, how great is the darkness. For no man can serve two masters. He'll hate the one and love the other, hold of the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The light of the body is the eye, and it better be single. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing have I desired of the Lord. One thing shall I strive after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 27, 1 and Psalm 27, 4. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 30, if you're not for me, you're against me. Now we're going to discuss the author, the captain, the king of darkness, Satan, and then conversely, the captain, the king, the commander of light, Jesus Christ. Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist you steadfast in your faith. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. We're not ignorant of his devices, lest Satan gain advantage over us. 2 Corinthians 2, 11. Paul identified that thorn in the flesh as a messenger of Satan to buffet me. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 9. And he is restless. He is powerful. Satan desires to have you, Jesus said to Simon Peter in Luke twenty two thirty one. 31. Vociferously, Peter said, he'll never get me. And 30 verses later, in Luke twenty two sixty one, 61, the devil had accomplished his task. He did get Peter. Peter wasn't as strong as he boldly professed to be. And the devil was stronger than he thought he was. But we can resist the devil and he'll flee from us, James 4, verse 7. We're not to give place to the devil, Ephesians 4, 27. Don't allow him any room to operate in our life. He is the tempter, 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. Satan hath hindered us, Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 2, 18. And if he could hinder Paul, I know he could hinder us. He is aggressive, bulldogish, tenacious. He's a foe that is not to be taken lightly. And a lot of people have been uh, snapped under by him because they were not prepared to face him. Second Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15, says that Satan and his angels are transformed into angels of light. I'm afraid as Satan beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so also your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. And so we need to appreciate the fact that he is an ardent foe. Our blessed Lord, who always told the truth, never was any guy found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2, 22, referred to Satan as the strong man, Luke eleven twenty two. He said, I've entered the strong man's house and spoiled his goods, Mark 3, 27. If our Lord would identify Satan as strong and powerful and awesome, he truly is. And one reason that darkness prevails is a lot of people are not prepared to meet Satan and to defeat him. Did you know another thing about the devil in darkness? He is the author of eternal outer darkness, Matthew 25, 30. Evil men will be cast into hell, which is described in this passage as outer darkness. So he's in charge of darkness throughout all eternity. And we need to beware of him. Well, let's see if we can identify him. How does the king of darkness operate? There are only three possible areas. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the vain glory of life, which is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of the Lord abideth forever. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. The same three avenues in which he tempted Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 and in parallel account of Luke chapter 4. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the vain glory of life. Sometimes, though, in presenting this, people see generally the gist of the Bible on this matter, but in a practical way, today, how does the devil work? Can we identify three areas of his work? I believe we can. 
First of all, he operates in the overt wickedness of the world. It's called heathenism. Not heathenism, but heathenism, which means that which panders to the flesh. And so he operates in the overt, blatant wickedness that you see every day on TV, the front page of the newspaper, the entertainer, entertainment pages of the newspaper. That's the devil's work. Overt wickedness, easily identified as the devil's work. He's not really very sly there. He just overwhelms men through camouflage and the wrong kind of emphasis and knowing how to use the bright lights and proper advertising and the makeup of uh, journalism to attract people in overt wickedness. But he also works in false religions, and this is very subtle. For a lot of people say, I'm religious, I'm spiritually minded, I have a Bible, I attend church services, but they don't listen to what they hear. They don't read carefully the contrast of what men are saying with what the Bible teaches. And this is a subtle way the devil works. He's always been sharp in false religions. Many false prophets have already gone out into the world, First John 4, verse 1. There were false prophets among the people, even as there should be false teachers among you, Second Peter 2, verse 1. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Words of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 15 and 16. And on and on the scriptures go warning us of those who are enemies of the cross of Christ, Philippians 3, 18. And there's nothing as subtle as a person who seems so sincere and so conscientious with Bible in hand, but perverts what the scriptures teach. And they think more of their emotional feeling than they do, thus saith the Lord. It's great to be conscientious, sincere, and emotional in the proper, balanced sense of that word biblically. But just to be a member of a religion does not say anything. There were false apostles in the first century, Revelation 2, 2, and those who exposed them were complimented by the Lord. There were even false Christs in the first century, Matthew 24, 24. And so the devil works with overt wickedness. We acknowledge that. The world says, surely that's the devil's work but also in error, teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men, your heart is far from me, Jesus said in Mark 7 and Matthew 15, verses 7 through 9. But there's another area in which the devil operates and shouts with glee over it, and that's within the church of the Lord, and getting brethren to array themselves against one another. You know, if the devil can get soldiers of Christ in the army of the Lord to fight one another and never get out on the battlefield of the world to whip up on him then he's really pleased. The demons believe and tremble, James 2.19. But if they can get the believers to war against one another, then he's won a great battle. And in John 6.67, our Lord said to his intimate few, will you also go away? In Mark 5.40, evil men mocked Jesus. They laughed him to scorn. But there isn't anything that hurts the cause of Christ more than brethren who war against one another. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, we see a combination of these three areas in which the devil works. If you've ever noticed the works of the flesh, which will keep people out of heaven, at least 55% of them deal with inward emotion and attitude, motivation, emphasis, even within us that are not external, that produce the external sins that will keep us out of the kingdom of heaven. In Acts 17, 16, when Paul saw the idolatry of Athens, the false religion of his day, his spirit stirred within him. But many of us who claim to have the spirit and mind of Christ, Romans 8, 9, Philippians 2, 5, do not understand how serious it is when religious error surrounds us and it doesn't even bother us. It's a tragedy how indifferent we are to that which caused our Lord and his apostles to weep. And so today the devil works through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the vain glory of life in these areas, and that brings darkness into a sin-cursed world. Well, in identifying darkness, we must identify the king of darkness and exactly who is the devil. In Revelation 12, 9, we have in one fell swoop a pretty strong point. He's called that old serpent, going back to the Garden of Eden. Satan, which means adversary. The devil, which means the diabolical one. And then last of all, he's called the deceiver of the whole world. If we can identify the author of darkness and withstand him and be prepared for him, then the devil's going to have a hard time gaining any sway in our lives. 
Well, first of all, he's an active adversary. Your dev the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He is that worthless one of Nahum 1.11. He is Beelzebub of Mark chapter 3. They've accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of demons. He said, that doesn't make any sense. You'd have Satan fighting Satan. These are the words that Abraham Lincoln used during the Civil War. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. He got that from Christ. In this conversation, when they accuse the Lord of casting out demons by the prince of demons, <clears throat> and he makes the point, I've entered the strong man's house and spoiled his goods. He is such an active adversary that he can cause King Herod to be sorry and ashamed that he made a decree that would cause the head of John the baptizer to be removed. But for the promise sake and for those who sat with him at meat, the king went against his own conscience and allowed it to be done. And after that, when Jesus came into his area performing miracles, he was afraid that John, whom he had beheaded, had been raised from the dead and was coming back to haunt him. But notice Mark 15, 9, or Matthew 14, 9. The king was sorry. Sorry he had made that rash promise. But for those who sat with him at meat and for the promise sake, he commanded to be given her. The devil is so active, he can get into a man's mind and work against his own conscientious scruples and still get him to do evil. How active is this adversary? Demas, my fellow laborer, Paul said in the little one-chapter book of Philemon. But the last account of Demas, and who is Demas? A gospel preacher, a fellow worker with Paul in evangelism. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. This active adversary continued to work. Balaam said, for all the silver and gold in the world, I wouldn't do what you want me to do. Well, he named his price. It was silver and gold. And when the Lord would not allow Balaam to curse his people, then Balaam got busy for silver and gold sake and preeminent sake to get the people of God to become so wicked that God would curse them. That's called the doctrine of Balaam in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And so he's an active adversary. He keeps coming after us. He keeps after us, whatever our weakness is. He is a bulldogish, tenacious, never give up foe. Who is he? He's a crafty chameleon. A chameleon is a lizard-like animal that changes colors, spots, and stripes to match its environment. And he knows what your weakness is. He knows what mine is. He won't attack you like he attacks me or vice versa. The point is he knows where to hit. He's a crafty chameleon. He doesn't have the same argument for you he may for me or the fellow next door or the one across the street. You may be strong in some areas. I believe Judas Iscariot was one of the wisest, brightest of all the apostles. But he had one grave, serious weakness, and that's where the devil keeps punching, punching, punching. He might have a different argument for James or John or someone else, but he knew exactly where, as a crafty chameleon, to change everything around to match the environment and the weakness of this person. Lot was probably not a bad person in Genesis 13, but he had one weakness, the lust of the eyes to look out and see where he wanted to go, and he pitched his tent toward Sodom, and you could put a postscript, he sent his family toward hell. This crafty chameleon who is very shrewd. Why have you allowed Satan to enter your heart to lie the Holy Spirit? Peter hauntingly asked Ananias Sapphira. And so this crafty chameleon found a place. In Romans chapter 7, Paul said, The very commandment that said thou shalt not covet made me want to covet all the more. I'm sold under sin, the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And that could be said of every sinner. The devil is shrewd. He's a crafty chameleon. That's why darkness is so dominant in this world. Who is he? He's a diabolical demon. He knows how to permeate our lives with his deadly work. You shall die in your sins, and where I go you cannot come. Diabolical demon, restless, difficult to tame. John 8, verse 21. In Matthew 25, 46, the goats on the left hand in the judgment day, spiritual goats are told, you'll go away into everlasting punishment. He is a diabolical demon. He isn't easy to defeat. Take heed lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. The major reason the book of Hebrews was written, Hebrews 3.12.
We're not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe unto the saving of the soul. You'll later write Hebrews 10, 38 and 39. The devil's at work. He is a diabolical demon. He does not give up easily. And who is this enemy of light, this author, this king, this commander of darkness? He is a subtle serpent. The great apostle Paul who wrote half the New Testament, the finest example of Christianity we have in the first century, said, I must buffet my body and bring it under subjection, lest after I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And then he tells to the Corinthians of 23,000 children of God in the wilderness who perished in one day because of sin, and says, let him that think if he stand to take heed lest he fall. When you're arrogant and prideful, this subtle serpent works on that. It's one of his greatest works. Judas and his love for money, as we've already mentioned, caused him, as much as he loved money, to realize too late to change the thing about Christ being delivered to the enemy. Threw the money down, the 30 pieces of silver, $17 in our money, threw it down at the, at the priest's feet and went out and hanged himself. And the Bible says, Judas, by transgression, fell. He probably thought he was ushering in the earthly kingdom that James and John and all the other apostles thought the nature of Christ's kingdom to be earlier, and he'd be secretary of treasury in the greatest and most powerful, awesome earthly kingdom there ever was. But now I realize this dastardly deed that he has committed, that he's cooperated with Satan and darkness and evil and error, and as much as he loved money, he threw it down and went out and hanged himself. The devil had used him. He's a subtle serpent. Second Timothy 3.13 says, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In Acts 13.8, on the first evangelistic tour, do you remember what Paul said to Elimus the sorcerer? Thou child of the devil, full of all subtlety and mischief, you have withstood the work of God. All of that because of an active adversary, a diabolical demon, a crafty chameleon, and a subtle serpent. Well, what are the devil's greatest arguments? This captain, this king of darkness. How does he get by with so much? How, why is there so much darkness engulfing and overwhelming the world today? What are his doctrines that can convince people to leave the arena of light and come into his shadowy kingdom? First of all, he says, you're already better than most. Don't worry about those preachments from pulpits and articles you read and TV lessons you hear preached by gospel preachers. You're already better than most. Just look around you. Look at all the billions of people on earth today. You're a whole lot better than the vast majority of them. They're just prophets of doom. They're just negative preachers. You know, Cornelius was a whole lot better than nearly anybody else in the Roman Empire. But he had to hear words whereby he might be saved, Acts chapter 10. A man came 40 miles to preach this man who was as morally upright, a person of integrity as you could find in the Roman Empire and in charge of a hundred Roman soldiers, this centurion was. He was already better than most, but he had to hear words whereby he might be saved. If I were to ask you to take a piece of paper and a pencil and write out a definition of who is a Christian, the definition of the life of Cornelius would match that. Prayerful man, almsgiving man, good man, but a lost man. Better than most, but not what he ought to be yet. The Ethiopian had come a thousand miles round trip by chariot to worship God the way he thought was right and returning was reading the scriptures. But he had to hear the gospel of Christ based on the prophecy of Isaiah 53 and then he stopped the preacher realizing as good as he was, as moral as he was, he yet needed to obey truth. Here's water. What doth it me to be baptized? Acts chapter 8. But that's one of the devil's favorite arguments. You're already better than most. How many times have you had some kinfolk you were discussing the Bible with? So I'm better than half the people down there at that church house already. And then they'll probably say, I don't care what the Bible says. I've got a feeling down deep in my heart that I trust more than all the Bibles in the world. Well, they may be better citizens, better Americans, better neighbors, better Democrats or Republicans or Texans or Oklahomans or whatever. But if they're not in Christ, they're lost. The devil knows that. But he keeps pounding this year already better than most. His next favorite argument is you've got to have some fun. Uh, don't listen to those people. They won't take all the fun out of your life. 
They say you can't drink or dance or gamble or smoke or on and on. You've got to have some fun. Romans 6, 21 says, What reward have you now in those things whereof you're ashamed? You've got to have some fun. Hebrews eleven twenty five says, There's pleasure in sin, but just for a season. The devil never tells you that. So when we analyze and scrutinize the arguments he makes, they sound good, especially to carnal, fleshly-minded, hedonistic people that pander to the flesh, but they make no sense at all when truth is measured by those foolish arguments. In Isaiah 57, verses 20 and 21, the wicked are like a troubled sea when they cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. We don't go down with a quick, hard fall. We just glide along. Little by little, we lighten our load. We can't tell right from wrong. Sin is a monster of such frightful countenance. To be hated needs but to be seen. But seen too often, familiar with its face, we first endure, then pity, and then embrace. The third argument of the devil is, you're strong enough to indulge a little. See, those prohibitions against sin are for folk that aren't as strong as you are. You're strong enough. You can engage in these things. You can view those things that would contaminate a lot of people, but you're better and stronger and wiser than that. You actually could almost dibble-dabble in sinfulness that wouldn't bother you because you are of a superior structure and nature. You're strong enough to indulge a little, but the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil, every form of evil. 1 Thessalonians 5.22. wonder why Paul wrote to folk who had been Christians a good while and who were his joy and his crown and tell them to think on things that are pure and honest and just and true and lovely and virtuous and of good report. Here they've been Christians a good while. They were dear to his heart, but he continued to tell them, think on proper things. And in 2 Corinthians 10.5, he said, bring every thought into captivity unto Christ. To those who had been in the church at Ephesus for a long, long time, Paul told Timothy, an evangelist under the elders of the church at Ephesus, flee youthful lusts, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from, get up and run from, iniquity. He's not talking to worldly people here. He's talking to members of the body of Christ who had been in the church a good while. But he said, you need to depart from iniquity. Keep thyself pure. Flee youthful lusts. Bring every thought into captivity unto Christ. But the devil has another argument that has hindered folk who believe they need to do better, who understand they need to obey the truth, who capture the zenith of what the Bible says about daily Christian living. But the devil has an argument for folk like that too. And for those who know the gospel of Christ and they ought to obey it. I don't know how many times I've talked to folk and I've said, do you not know the plan of salvation? Yes. Do you know it thoroughly? Yes. Do you understand how it applies to you? Yes. Don't you believe you should have obeyed it a long time ago? Yes. Well, what is the devil's argument? Tomorrow. Wait a while. Some other time. In fact, if you'll just acknowledge you ought to obey the truth, that's as good as obeying. I really believe a lot of people salve their conscience by coming to hear the truth preached and never doing anything about the truth they preach, but saying, Lord, I listen to truth. I appreciate truth. Wasn't that great truth? You remember the legendary story of the devil who called all his emissaries into a council room, and he said, I need one of you to go back to earth and convince all those people not to become a Christian. That would be deadly to our cause. What would be your chief argument if we sent you back? One fellow said, I'll go back and say there is no God. The devil said, that won't work. There are too many manifestations that there is a God, the orderliness and design of the universe. That wouldn't sway anybody. Another fellow said, I'll go back and say there is a God, but he doesn't have any law. Satan said, that doesn't make sense. A God who made the world and everything in it and everybody in it after his own image, but he has no law for them to follow. Another fellow said, well, I'll go back and say there is a God and he has a law, but there are no commandments that you have to obey. The devil said that wouldn't make sense. If there is a God and he has a law and he issues commands, he expects them to be obeyed. Another fellow said, well, I'll go back and tell him there is a God, he has a law, he has commands we must obey, and we can do it tomorrow. The devil said, go. And that 
statement, that teaching has been in the world all these days. Tomorrow, some other time, manana, don't get excited now. But the Bible says today, if you'd hear his voice, harden not your heart. Hebrews 3.15. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day shall bring forth. Proverbs 27.1. It is time to seek the Lord. Hosea 10.12. The Bible is replete with passage after passage that tell us we know not the day of our death, Genesis 27, 2. And so now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6, 2. I believe he uses that same argument on members of the church who intend to do better tomorrow, to pray more, study the Bible, give more, teach somebody tomorrow, some other day. I plan to do it. I intend to do it. I know I ought to do it. And I'll do it someday. There we've analyzed, investigated, the king of darkness and how he operates. In the moments remaining, we thankfully say that Christ is the architect of light. He brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.10 If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Two verses before that epical statement of 1 John 1.7 if we say we follow God and walk in darkness, we do lie and tell not the truth, for in him is no darkness at all. I wonder how many of us have ever prayed to the Lord, uh, to the God of heaven, and thanked him for Jesus Christ, the architect of light. And that we don't have to wander around in darkness and sin and shame. We can hold our heads up high and walk through the light of the counsel of God's word and be blessed and redeemed and useful for time and eternity. We mentioned that the devil is forever dealing with darkness, and even in eternity, sinners will spend eternity with him in outer, everlasting, eternal darkness. But in Revelation 21, verses 22 and 23, we read that when it comes to eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ is all the light that's needed there. So he is continuing to be the captain of light, and how blessed we are for that. In Romans 16, 20, Paul said, God shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. In 1 John 3, 8, for this cause was the Son of God made known that he might bring to naught the power of the devil. 1 John 4, 4, he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. In 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 5, we have perhaps one of the most blessed of all references in five succinct verses, listen carefully, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 to 5. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost." in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sake. When I was a boy, one of my favorite friends was Brother John Elmore, who led the singing in the congregation back home. He and I shared a favorite song. I would often ask him on Sunday night, is it time to lead that again? The only problem was when we got the second stanza, I sometimes started it before he did. And he said, Johnny, just let me do that, please. But it remained our favorite song. We used to talk about it. There are days so dark that I seek in vain for the face of my friend divine, but though darkness hide, he is there to guide by the touch of his hand on mine. How blessed we are that light shineth in darkness that we have the Lord Jesus Christ as the captain of our salvation and the commander of light, and that he is able to destroy and defeat that which the devil would do. To the Ephesians, Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, beginning with verse 17, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk no longer in darkness. And he goes on to speak of those who do, through the blindness of their heart, who are past feeling who have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all manner of uncleanness with greediness. And then he quickly says, but you have not so learned Christ. If so be you have heard him, been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former man, the old man, the former life, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, 
and put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Now let's notice in a definitive way what Christ is the captain of. He sheds light on prophecy. No prophecy of the scriptures for any private interpretation. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter 1, 20 and 21. But Revelation 19, 10 says, The spirit of the prophets was the testimony of Jesus. Jesus said before he went back to heaven, All that's been written in the law and the Psalms and the prophets concerning me hath been fulfilled. Luke 24, 44. He sheds light on prophecy. First Peter 1, 10 to 13. What the prophets foretold and the angels desire to look into, you're the recipients of this great salvation. And Christ Jesus is the author of it. Never forget the power and beauty of that overlooked passage of 1 Peter 1, 10 through 13. Another reason he brings light into the world is he mediates a superior covenant. He is the mediator of a better covenant established upon better promises. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which waxeth old and decayeth is ready to vanish away. Hebrews 8, beginning with verse 6. Then saith he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which testament we're sanctified, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That statement of Hebrews 10 and the one of Hebrews 8 tells us the new covenant is the superior covenant, and the captain of light mediates it, because it isn't written on tables of stone, but upon the heart. It isn't for the Jews alone, but for all mankind. Now, you don't inherit it by physical birth, but through the new birth. And under its sins are forever forgiven and not retained. He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God by him, seeing ever liveth to make intercession for us. For such an high priest is becoming unto us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. Why is he the principle of light? Because he provides rich blessings incomprehensible. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto God be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Ephesians 3 tells us of these rich provisions, blessings. He left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. The statement of Acts 14, 17 reminds us of Ephesians 1, 3. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. In him we live and move and have our very being. He is the one who gives us every good and perfect gift. James 1, 17, Acts 17, 28 to 30. He is the architect of light because he grants redemption through his church. He purchased the church with his own blood. Acts 20, 28. He loved the church and gave himself up for it. Ephesians 5, 23 to 25. The blood which purchased the church purchased the remission of our sins. Matthew 26, 28. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant, that great shepherd of the sheep draws us near to God. The closing finale of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. He is the architect of light because he promises a brighter future, a brilliant future in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promised before the world began. Titus 1 verse 2. He is now in heaven for us. Hebrews 9 24. He's our forerunner to heaven. Hebrews 6 19 and 20. And we should look for a better country that is in heavenly. Hebrews eleven sixteen. Our citizenship is in heaven from whence we look for the Savior who shall fashion our vile body like in his glorious body. Philippians 3 20 and 21. And so he, the architect of light, draws us to heights sublime. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things will become new. And that salient message of that brilliant verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, reminds us of what follows the works of the flesh that keep us out of the kingdom of heaven. But contrastingly, conversely, contradistinctively, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Against such, there is no law. Now we're ready for the climactic statement on this whole subject. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 
Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, and he goes on to say distress, persecution. Nay, in all these things we're more than conquerors, them that love us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How blessed we are to have the commander of light overwhelm the architect of darkness. The light of the body is the eye. If thine eye be single, how great is that light. Greetings, everyone. Speech on. I just played Johnny Ramsey. Screen recording in progress. Top of screen. Double tap to open and pause. Next item. Button. Screen recording in progress.